You want to whistle a tune? Yeah. Do, 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 do. No, I'm not quitting my day job. I'm good. <laughs> I literally just pictured the uh, the two guys at the back of the room, uh, the Muppets heckling Miss Piggy up at the front singing after I started humming there. So maybe I'll stop. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yeah. I bet you none of their comments are really funny now out of context. But when I was, you know, 10, they seemed hilarious. Sense of humor has changed over the last, you know, 30 years. What that all started off in the 70s, Jim Henson. Muppets, yeah. Yeah, it was that 70s, 60s, 70s. I think, it, I think it was really successful like late 70s, early 80s. So maybe I was on the tail end of it. I'm lying about my age now. We're going to give it till about five after and then we'll get going. Yeah. Oh, I reckon Mr. Tony Harris, my digital twin friend. Tony, don't get too mad at me about uh, today's episode because I will be talking about digital twins and how bastardized that term is. <laughs> I've got an ex-colleague from Cisco on the call here too. So we've got, we definitely got some buzzwords out of our history that may come back to bite us. We may get some nasty messages. Yeah. Well, this is going to be right up Danielle's alley. You know, she's doing uh, con marketing consulting work around, you know, how do you market for prop tech entities? So I bet she'll have a lot of strong opinions about this. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of blame to go around on this stuff, right? I'm guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a bunch of us have been doing this for a while. You know, Kyle, I got I got carded at a liquor store the other day and my Blockbuster card fell out. Cashier just said, never mind. You literally still have a Blockbuster card in your wallet? No, I'm totally joking. Okay. <laughs> I guarantee you there's people walking around with a wallet that thick that still has Blockbuster cards in their back pocket. I had to tell my son that... Uh, playing some music and I was like I had this on a cassette tape and he was like what the hell is that <laughs> there's Danielle's note in the Q&A is chat supposed to be disabled how will I ever express my strong opinions just like that Danielle <laughs> <laughs> are you serious Q&A's uh, there should be Q &A's. yeah the Q&A worked it popped up okay yeah chat's disabled but We're just the personalities, Danielle. We're not the logistics folks. We may have to try and work on this for next one to get the chat active. You're allowed to ask questions, but judgment has to be. Uh, yeah. You can call me <laughs> after the fact and judge. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we should probably get going, Kyle. You uh, want to get going? All right. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, for those that have joined, thank you very much. Welcome to episode number five of IB Thinking About. I'm Kyle Took, Senior Director of Client Services for Intelligent Buildings. And I'm Andy Schomberger, VP Client Services at IB. Thanks for joining today. Uh, we had some fun last week in, in Las Vegas for the 2023 RealCom IBCon. Got to rub shoulders with best and brightest from our industry, and Kyle was there too. Sure. All right, just joking. Anyway, lots, I think, of, of lessons learned, some cool topics that we could talk about that came out of it. We really, like, we got to see a lot of, of you know, cool stuff, some really smart people, some great sessions. Andy, lots Andy, I mean, I, so I was, you know, we were in the uh, conference where all the, all the vendors and everything, well, I got to tell you, I was very, very inspired last week. So I've got an amazing idea, the most innovative disruptive, game-changing idea our industry has ever seen. You want to hear about it? Uh, do, I have a, do I have a choice? All right, so 
<laughs> no, not really. Um, so you know how, I mean, obviously I've got extensive background in prop tech and you know, lots of things about stuff and, you know, I pretend I know what I'm talking about and I've got the idea of the best solution ever for our industry. I'm going to call it the ecosystem of platforms. And I want you to imagine a building operating system that's backed by blockchain, you know, because tokenization and stuff. And it sits on top of a digital twin uh, with a generative AI engine that can visualize through, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guarantee, guarantee that's going to lower your carbon footprint and energy consumption by 113.4%. It's going to be a total game changer. Seriously? You, you, you didn't add paradigm in there. Paradigm shift. What are you talking about? Dude, I'm telling you, it's genius. Absolute genius. Are, are you in marketing or sales or engineering? Like th none of those words meant anything to me. I, it, but it's going to be amazing. <laughs> this, this is the challenge that we have to overcome in this industry all the time. Our clients are so confused by every buzzword that could be thrown at them. Uh, you know, in terms of what a product, a service, or a uh, a widget is is, is going to promise, it's going to deliver, and it just gets people so twisted up and sends them down the wrong path. And like, we really have to help them define what they need, so then they can go out to the market and ask for it, as opposed to just having goodness knows what thrown at them to see what'll stick and 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 what they'll open their wallets for. I mean, so you, don't have, you don't have faith in my idea. Is that what you're telling me? Well, no, there's there's some concepts in there that are going to impact our industry for sure. But man, you just took word salad and, and threw it all together, right? I mean, oh, well, it's it's frankly, it's a lot of what we heard last week. And I, I love all of my colleagues in the prop tech industry. And look, I've been on that side of the fence for many, many years and have you know been guilty uh, of this myself. This was just case in point. So you know, um, you know, I'll, real quick, I want to jump out to, you know, the folks that are in attendance here, and I'm going to launch a poll, everyone. Uh, I want you to just answer the first question for now. So of all of the jargon, acronyms, things that we hear across our industry, you know, what are, what are the ones that you guys think are most fluffy? Yeah, there's, there's some confusing ones there, right? Some of these terms are maybe from an individual vendor who's pushed it. Some of them are design strategies. Some of them are from the consumer space and everyone's trying to figure out how does this apply to buildings? You know, some of them are giant, hairy, you know, business terms. And, and again, you can make it what you want. Um, yeah, each one of these, you got to unpack almost, you know, independently. <laughs> yeah. To not talk about an independent data layer. Well, and I, uh, well, I got 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 something for you here, Andy. So why do you, why do you think building owners put beehives on top of their buildings? Oh, for ESG and social responsibility and environmental benefit. Oh no, you were looking for hell something. no. It's to help them understand the buzzwords. <laughs> of course, <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course. These are always more entertaining when neither one of us knows when the other one's going to pull out one of these jokes, isn't it? <laughs> it's a little more natural. Uh, I don't know if we're cringing hard enough for everybody else on here, but we're trying. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Um, some of us already answered the second and third questions. That's okay. Um, we'll revisit those here in just a little bit, but I'm going to share the results. And it looks like we've got you know Metaverse, AIML, Digital Twin, ESG, Independent data layer, which you know I've, I've lived in, you know these these concepts for years. Metaverse, not so much, but the other ones very much so. Uh, you know, for those of you who've met me before, I um, used to live in the digital twin world, and you know, just even if I take digital twin building operating system AIML and independent data layer, right? All of this gets meshed up, and like oftentimes, like just digital twin building operating system and IDL they get confused as the same thing all the time. And, you know, just the term digital twin, you can go to 50 different vendors that say they have a digital twin. They do 50 totally different things, right? There's any number of vendors that were on the floor last week that are 
digital twins. Um, um, we're going to be going out to, uh, well, uh, Omar El Yacobi and I will be at BOMA next week, and there's going to be a couple of digital twins on the floor there. And I guarantee you they do very, very different things. So it gets confusing. I've had vendors come to me and say, Kyle, I need a digital twin. I ask them why. They can't even answer the question. Yeah. You know? And then you get into the analytics tools who also call themselves digital twins. And then you, you know, they say that they're AI and ML and, you know, in reality, you need so much data to actually implement machine learning and get something from it. Uh, I don't think there's too many of our buildings that got that wealth of data to even take machine learning and put it into practice. What do you think about that, Andy? Yeah, I, look, I think there's a lot of really smart people in our industry. Um, and, and and you can tell, I mean, go to a conference like Realcom, you know, if you if anybody attended the, the boot camp in the past, you know, we get speakers talking about the, the nuts and bolts of how analytics work. And you get some very, very smart folks that know how to make this stuff work and know how to look at the data out of building systems and identify simultaneous heating and cooling and translate that into energy savings. And if you go through some of these and how those those rules work and, and how that those engines work and how the data needs to be connected and how those algorithms all work. And, and you try to share that with an asset manager who's your buyer and their eyes roll back in their heads so fast. They, they, it may have well have been a different language that was just spoken to them. So I think we have to do a better job in this industry of, of that translation to, to, you know, pure business language. And, and sometimes for very technically minded folks, that feels like you're just dumbing it down way too hard, but um, a, a lot of times in our industry, a lot of us, you know, folks who are living and breathing this on a day-to-day -day basis with digital twin tools or analytics engines or, or AI tools, as an example, we have seen some, especially recently that we would qualify as, as AI tools in, in our uh, humble opinions. Um, and, and you, you, you have to try and address the client's problem. It's more like, you know, in some, you may have seen some sales training that's, you know, solution selling. Um, you know, you want to be consultative in, in how you go, uh, you know, uh, uh, in trying to solve clients' problems. So you start with what do they care about and how do you address their problems and then show them, you know, the ways that you can do it as opposed to here's my product stack and here is the bill of materials. Don't you think I'm smart? Let's do this. That, that I you see a, still a lot of that in industry. And, you know, right now we're certainly challenged in commercial and corporate real estate with you know, high interest costs, cost of capital is high. There's, you know, not a lot of people are renewing leases at nearly the same rate they were. They're taking less space. There's higher regulatory needs. There are so many challenges to address in this industry. And if you're throwing a technical solution, a widget or a baked service at an owner who is inundated from that side with it, you're going to have challenges and they're going to get annoyed at the buzzwords. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, this is a lot to unpack. Well, and I, you know, we had a lot of very candid conversations with end users with, uh, for, you know, large fortune 500, um, companies as well as large owners and developers last week. And we found that it just speak straight language. Don't stay away from the jargon, stay away from all the acronyms. Stay Look, we've been guilty of it too, at, at intelligent buildings. You know, how many times Andy have we, talked about OT cybersecurity and the person we're talking to doesn't even know what the hell OT means. Yeah. Right. You can't jump to too um, many conclusions. Yeah. So, you know, if you use this common basic language and just talk very direct, very bluntly about the outcomes, the goals, the things that are actually what you're solving for, instead of getting yeah. too uh, hung up in, in how amazing your tech is and, you know, all of the different technical aspects of it, because you're just going to speak over most of the people who are actually making economic decisions with these organizations, you're just going to speak over their head. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've talked about this too, right? Like who is the buyer of these services or solutions or technology? And I think our industry is one of our industry's biggest challenges is different every time in every organization. It might be someone that is, you know, technical and does understand all those details. And in fact, may know more than the vendor about their particular, you know, stack of, of services and solutions and vendors. Um, and then you may have an asset manager who's just trying to fill a building or, or a, a developer who's trying to, you know, fill the building and flip it, you know, or it could be someone with a massive portfolio that holds buildings long-term and they'll all approach this differently. And you, you can't assume that you have a technology sophisticated buyer. You know, in, in a former life, I was selling IT type services and trying to solve technology challenges. Almost all cases there, you had tech savvy buyers. So you could assume, you know, a certain level of knowledge about terminology and, and about networks, for example. 
if you assume that in our industry, sometimes you're putting your foot in your mouth, you may as well be just grabbing the word salad or, you know, the, the word cloud that we showed in the boot camp, for example, and you got to start with basic terminology, just, just to have a conversation about solving a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and a lot of this jargon ends up making its way into a lot of the outbound marketing and, and customer and user facing materials. And so, you know, one of the other things I think our industry has been very guilty of is a lot of fluffy marketing, right? A lot of white, white, I'm going to do quotes here. So white papers and case studies and real life examples of where things have been implemented and executed and got these amazing, tremendous results. And when you actually dig into them, yeah, there's there are organizations out there that put together very, very compelling white papers and case studies that are amazing. They're doing some amazing things. And these are the ones that are on the leading edge and are executing on projects and actually delivering what they say. But how many times do we see these fluffy, you know, one sheeters or two sheeters that talk about this generic number of, you know, we're going to reduce energy consumption by 15 to 25%. I mean, look, Outside of the you know building automation system and some of the rules engines and things that you can apply to a building, there's only so many texts that you can stack on top of each other and still be able to make that claim. If a system's already, if a building's already got a bunch of tech already in it that's contributing to that, and then you're going to say you're going to layer your tech on top of that and drop it another 25%, I'm just going to call nonsense on that. D didn't you just promise 113.4%? Yeah, 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 it's going to happen too. <laughs> yeah, it, it, guaranteed. Listen. <laughs> and it happens all the time on the topic du jour, right? Because, you know, our, the, the, the leaders in industry are asking, what's the, what's the payback on this? And in a lot of cases, there may or may not be a payback for them, depending on the solution or the service. It might even just be a design decision that would make sense in a particular asset, but not in others, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example because I really like the format and shout out to James Dice with, with Nexus Labs. I listened to their podcast yesterday uh, and, and they did an innovative format that was um, like a, a, a high school debate um, between pros and cons about the independent data layer with some some very smart people on it. I'd encourage you to go and, and, and check that out. Um, and, and I really liked it because the whole time I just kept thinking, great, when when would this make sense? You know, does it, do I have to have a property? Like, can someone show me some numbers? Like where, you know, I, I get the promise of a solution like that, but could someone show me actual numbers like in construction projects or in, you know, across a portfolio, like where, if I'm going to spend more on this, where does it save me somewhere else? Because the vendors will promise these sorts of things, but okay, now where and when I get the idea of, you know, the positive positives of plug and play, or maybe not just specific to an IDL here, but like, show me the net savings on this, Right. Um, and I'd, I'd love it if those are real numbers. Now there's the challenge, right? Because if you're on stage or you're in a format like we are right here, we can't, you know, share customer proprietary information. It's a competitive capitalist society here. Not everybody wants to show that completely independently. Um, you know, sometimes those executives are up on a panel and they see their competitive competitors in the crowd or heck on the panel beside them, as happens a lot, like at Realcom. So they're not going to actually give the real nuggets that somebody would learn for if they're really competitive. I mean, you know, there's elements they'll collaborate on, cybersecurity probably being one of those. Hmm. Nobody wants to see their competitor get breached. I mean, maybe some do, but not generally. Most people are good about this. Well, they wouldn't say it to their face. Yeah. So they'll, mm -hmm. you know, they still collaborate on industry standards and things like that, but it's hard to pull those nuggets out of people. Every now and again, you'll see someone do a case study and you're like, Oh, that's amazing. It wasn't just an anecdote about what they screwed up. There was dollars and cents and per square foot numbers and who signed off on it and where did we screw up and what are we doing next? Those are the diamonds in the rough when you see those case studies at conferences because they're sadly the exception rather than the rule, unless it's something like the, the building showcase you know, at Realcom where you can actually go and talk to the project leaders and maybe tease some of this stuff out that they didn't put on their one pager. I mean, that's, that's like, those are the things that I get most value out of is when I go to those things and I actually, you know, hear what were the challenges, what did we do to solve for them? It doesn't have to be, we did X, Y, and Z product, or we did, you don't have to get into the proprietary stuff, but like, you know, just the thought sharing around the challenges, how we approached it, who was involved, you know, how did we go about this? Did we leverage, you know, consultants to help us with this? Did Was it internal, right? These are all factors that depending upon your size of organization, it's critical information to know as they're trying to figure out how they're going to approach those things. Excuse me. <clears throat> did you use chat DPT to get your definition of a smart building? 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I did not. No, I've already, I've already got like 800 different versions of that definition already baked yeah. into here anyway. You know, I, I don't know. You saw me try to do this live to get ChatGPT to, to display that that definition. And nobody in the audience commented on, on the details uh, under it, except for one person who said I was using the free version of ChatGPT. So the answer probably wasn't any good. Yeah. And I was like, busted. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to own that one. <laughs> well, and we were talking a little bit. So we talked about the white papers and case studies and things like that. And this often also, um, I don't know, I, I've got mixed feelings around like the conferences, right? So, you know, I've always been on the vendor side of it. So I have my bias and perspective on this. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to throw any platforms or any certain conferences under the bus here. But, you know, I've been going to these conferences in our industry for years in years, in years, and I've been on stage, and I've been in the audience, and I tell you, I'm almost getting to the point where I no longer like to attend the sessions, because all I hear is the same vague and yeah. uh, high-level approach to communicating anything strategic about our industry, um, and I don't, I'm, you know, it's not necessarily the individuals that are up there either, I just feel like a lot of these sessions they're just they're too high level they're not strategic they're not um prescriptive and and and, and really like I, I find that they're they're lacking the education that really these conferences were meant to to help with um i virtually stopped going to the actual sessions i mean what do you think about that yeah you gotta you gotta look for those targeted sessions you gotta look for maybe there is a vendor you want to talk to or there is a client you would really like to have a sidebar conversation I, I I think going for the networking is is probably the the highest and best value. But if there is a topic you're trying to get yourself up to speed on, then you can look for those sessions. You know, maybe it is something as simple as what we you know the boot camp. Somebody new to this industry trying to get up to speed. Let's not let us you know because we've gone to Realcom or you know or some Boma sessions or gone to ULI or the USGBC's conferences or 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 keep going because we've been doing them for years and now we might be a little jaded. There's still a lot of value I think for a lot of people. It does convene quite a few people. Um, but yeah, I wish there was a bit of a hurdle for some of the sessions because I'd agree with you that pretty easy to just get you know lost in your phone. I think the poll results uh, on, on getting value out of this is a, a good a good uh, more than half of people go and they're like, I don't I don't I don't know if I get any value. Hot well, air in the, I, hot I feel air like in the room if you're gonna me. go to one of these sessions, you should be able to take something from that session, bring it home and implement, right? Or share education. Yeah. And I wasn't referring to, you know, IB bootcamp. Obviously that's just amazing. Totally valuable. Yeah. yeah super valuable. So I wasn't referring to IB bootcamp, <laughs> um, but you know, joking aside, right. You need to be able to go to one of these sessions. I mean, people are spending a lot of money to go to these conferences, uh, especially those of us that are on the vendor side, yeah. but you know, you go to these conferences, you want to be in these sessions, you want to be able to take notes and be able to come back and actually apply, right. Those learnings. Um, and I, I just, I, I hear too much theory on these stages. Yeah. Uh, Robert made a post in, in the Q and a saying you can, you can deploy all the tech in the world, but if you don't have a solution for harmonics in your electrical system, <laughs> you can still lower consumption by 10 to 20%. <laughs> uh, Robert, I'm a mechanical engineer, so no comment. Um, but, but yeah, there's, there's, there's some good ones we could come up with here to just see if you can get people to blink, you know, if you're, 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 you're throwing word salad at them, but, uh. Yeah, mechanical engineer. Don't. I'm not going to get in trouble. No comment. <laughs> uh, I'm actually. I'm going to reopen. Let me see if I can reopen or relaunch the poll. Hopefully, it doesn't reset everything. If it does, yeah, you're going to have to answer again, everyone. <laughs> um, so we've already gone through number one. Um, I want everyone to answer number two and number three while we're going through. You know, right, right, and and get your feedback on those two questions. <clears throat> yeah, the traditional marketing angles are complicated in this space, right? I mean, Kyle, when you started, you know, in in kind of a you know in a BD sales role, how much cold calling were you expected to do? Well, I, I've never had the luxury of having a sophisticated marketing department hey, hey. ever in my career, <laughs> uh, and, and, and you know, I've had to generate my own. Now, look, that's that's same here at. at intelligent builds too. So uh, Amanda, don't shoot me after this. Uh, so, 
you know, I, I've been required or I, I, it's always the expectation I had to generate my own leads. And so um, I, I found, you know, obviously in my early career, there's a lot of grinding. You you do the best that you can to target your your communication out to the individuals that you want to schedule meetings with at these events. But, uh, you know, what ends up happening is a lot of that jargon, a lot of those acronyms, a lot of that fluff creeps its way into your emails as well. And a lot of end users, and I still get, the, I'm getting inundated by BOMA emails right now. Yep. That's but, uh, for people who have no freaking clue what I do or what, what Intelligent Buildings is, and they're just generic blanket marketing emails that I just delete. That's why I sent you and I'm not going. I just wanted to avoid those emails. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> And, um, but you know, when I was younger, I, it was, I never relied on email. I've never been a fan of email. And so it would be me, you know, actually calling people and, and, and getting meetings that way. Um, these days it's more, you know, leveraging connections, current relationships. Cause I've been around the industry for quite some time and, um, you know, getting introductions, like that's the, the more effective way. But I, I will absolutely say in my younger years, when I was doing a massive amount of outbound email, um, and, you know, leveraging scripts and things like that, it was riddled with just jargon and, and people tune out to that. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, look, I, like I said it earlier, I'm, you know, in, in my answer to Robert, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, started off actually doing engineering, go figure before I got into, you know, the, the, the business side of things. Um, and so I was fine with the technical questions and talking about the solutions and how to do things. Uh, and then I got sales training you know, formal sales training of here's how you should follow up and here's structure for this email. And I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing now. What this, the sales training world and the marketing side of things, it's, it can be pretty disconnected from uh, reality, I think. But yeah, we didn't mean to, to start getting into sales is a dirty word, uh, but, but inevitably this, so much of this is sales driven from people trying to close quotas. That's why there's so much activity, right? You kind of, you get that mandate to start cold calling and and if you don't know what you're doing, if you're a junior engineer or you're a junior sales rep, what do you do? You fall back on what you're given, right? From marketing or what have you. So yeah, I, I'd agree. The more you can network, the more you can use, you know, forums like this or like, you know, again, not, I should, we should probably get a commission out of James Dice on this, but you know, his, his community, if you will, um, going to those events and looking for like-minded people to get real info out of the projects, that's where you get those real nuggets of information. Like I, one of the things I always advocate is go to every building tour you can, you know, at these conferences, if they offer those as, you know, pre-conference events or, you know, pay to go as extra, cause then you can get into it with people who are running this stuff and what problems did you really have? And, and maybe you get still some fluff out of them cause they might not want to say everything, but you'll get nuggets out of that, that become real touch points. Um, Yeah. I want to open this up. So question number two is, you know, do you get real value out of the comfort sessions? And four of the respondents said yes. So uh, my ask is, you know, for those of you that uh, I won't call your name out unless you want me to. Uh, but when, uh, you know, in the Q&A, you know, what what are the things that you're getting out of these sessions that you are getting the most value out of? I just want to explore that a little bit. So if you answered yes to number two, um, go in the Q&A and, you um, let, let us know, like, what, what, what do you get that's highly valuable out of the sessions? Yeah, Stephen makes a point in the comment there that conferences are about as honest as a sales demo with some tech support, basically. Um, yeah, listen, there's, there's a reality to that too, right? The vendors are the ones sponsoring these conferences to, to drive money. It's, it's a lot like, you know, uh, uh, media you know, you have to be a little sensationalist to attract the advertising to get, you know, to be able to pay for the content development. So uh, it, part of this is the nature of the beast. Um, and and hopefully there's still value in the content. It doesn't swing too far. Otherwise people get annoyed and they'll go somewhere else. Well, the hard part is, is, is just cutting through the, the fluff, right? So um, is what, what do you, how, do, how does a, without going through a rigorous RFP, because I know we all love RFPs. They're amazing. So much fun <laughs> to participate in, right? But, you know, for an end user to make a, a good techno technology decision, you know, either one, they just trust you and go off of your word. Two, they go, they put you through a very, very rigorous multi-month um, sales cycle or RFP 
process if you're lucky, um, you know, which adds immediately, you know, three to six months if they stay on track because RFPs always stay on track uh, on their timeline. Um, sarcasm intended there. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's how do you how do you get that fine line between marketing fluff and actually getting to what's real and and helping a buyer's decision making process go that much easier? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 the biggest question, right? I mean, I think it's a collaborative process. Danielle makes a note there in the Q&A that one of the best sessions she attended was mostly just a Q&A with someone as an expert, right? Um, a chance to to get, you know, particular questions answered. And, and you know, you I don't, I don't know, Danielle, you may or may not have gotten direct answers in every one of those questions, but, you know, at least you have a, a chance in a forum like that to ask questions as opposed to being talked at, right? Um, you'll notice that one of the things uh, that Kyle and I were adamant about in doing this I'd be thinking about series was we are not going to ram half an hour PowerPoint down your throat because what no conversational is better we can make some terrible jokes and at least try to keep your attention a little bit longer while having interaction like this. Um, but but Kyle to your point um, to actually be a little real about this we know that in projects to make them successful these you know uh, own, building owners investors developers keep going occupiers. First, they got to get at the, the expertise, right? Whether they've got it internally, whether they hire a consultant, whether they get the vendors to design build with them, they obviously are trying to do something better with their buildings and they, they need access to that expertise. We know they have to build off a current state and almost no one in our industry is starting from a blank sheet of paper all the time. They either have biases or partners already or, you know, or it's an existing building that they have to, they can't just rip and replace everything. So that we know their baseline has to start from somewhere. So now they've got a bit of a filter on what they should or could listen to in, in terms of market solutions. Then they got to stitch together these pieces, right? Now it is wading through the marketing. Maybe it is formal procurement, like you just said in an RFP. Maybe it's get three quotes. Maybe it's, <laughs> this still happens. I go golfing with the guy. So his quote was good. You know, there's still some of that to stitch pieces together. And then underneath it all, you got it, all the technical details of a smart building stack, right? You got to have the basic building blocks. You got to have your systems connected, interoperable and secure and data available. And now you can, you know, through good design, build up what your smart building program technically is, uh, how it works. So quite, quite a lot of pieces there, but I think that maybe a little bit of argument from our, uh, you know, our, our uh, attendees here, but a lot of those things are pretty common across industry. How you put the pieces together there leads you down paths for particular solutions then you may need an independent data layer. Then you may get a lot of value out of a digital twin if you're going to take, you know, all this live data and and you know uh, and take your BIM model and and actually have, you know, uh, your live data uh, tagged and 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 tracked in it and being used by operations staff and you can do modeling in it and you can actually have some of the you know analytics change building systems on the fly. That may absolutely be a solution for you, but you kind of got to build your way there as opposed to starting it the other way, moving back. Yeah. Well, and, um, I do want to go back to one thing that Danielle um, was talking about, which was the open forum, right, is, is having the open dialogue, open back and forth between the audience and the, the subject matter experts on the stage. I mean, I'll be frank, that's probably one of the few uh, formats um, that I've seen that I've gotten most value out of is the back and forth, you know, the ask me anything type of format, because yeah. then you get real questions answered, right? Um, you know, I, I did a fireside chat format last week and I was angry that there wasn't a real fire. So, <laughs> um, I'm still bitter about that. Um, so it's kind of cold in there. We got to be but, able to do a no, live. I, mean, I absolutely agree fire, with right? you on, on that. I, I also, and Joe Amador is a brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and, you know, he was the one that was on the other end of that, uh, that session. Um, love Joe. Very, very, very smart guy. Yeah, tap the expertise in, in industry and, and have people like Danielle keep you honest that we're not just going to disable the chat and be another one of those you know, <laughs> services or, or vendors and craft the message. <laughs> oh. Oh, uh, I'm going to open this back up to the audience. If there's any other Q&A, any, anything that you want to ask the two of us, uh, we're happy to. Uh, and then we're going to introduce the, the next episode for July. Uh, any other questions from the audience? If you want to type in the Q&A, now is the time. So while, while you're getting that organized here, this is actually the background I wanted to use, but <laughs> our, our marketing ooh, department ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> didn't think it was appropriate, but this is the inspiration for Kyle and I in, in this format um, without really heckling. 
um, but 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 kind of the inspiration. I think most of the heckling goes from you to me. It seems like you either make fun of my hair or tell me I'm not smart. <laughs> it's fun. it's fun, right? I expect it to come back the other way. I know it's coming. Uh, let's see. Daniel's got a question. Every customer is starting with something you already have tech, unless it's a total new bill. Oh, it's not a question, Daniel. This is the time to ask questions. Yeah. Dan Danielle's point, every customer is starting with something. That's, that's exactly right. Um, it, no one has a clean sheet of paper, even the new designs, you know, that you're working on with someone on a brand new tower, they still, their teams have biases or they have you know, their GC has pre-selected vendors that they understand the margins on. Like there's, there's legacy issues we're contending with all the time when we're trying to help clients innovate. Great point. All right. So here is, here's a very good question. So does it cost more to operate all this technology? Well, that's going to be a case, by case and it can cost you more, especially if there's not a, a tangible ROI that's directly tied to the implementation of that technology. Also, if that technology is not integrated and done in a way where the foundational elements are in place, it can absolutely cost more money. And yep. there's situations where you end up having to rip stuff out to get the end result that you wanted in, in the first place. So the, the main thing that an organization is going to have to do is one, they're going to have to make sure that the foundational elements of any data and any technology that goes into that asset, right, is, is meant and structured in a way that's going to enable whatever use cases and outcomes they want to enable. And you need to be able to measure that return, right? There's a lot of tech where there's not a very uh, tangible, concrete return on investment. There's a lot of um, nice to haves or a lot of... Uh, you know, quality of life type uh, of investments from a technology perspective that can be made. Um, I would say that when you look at a workplace experience app, that's a that's a pretty challenging solution to quantify a tangible ROI on because that's really around re you know employee attraction and retention, uh, tenant attraction and retention, and trying to back into a quantifiable ROI on that is uh, I've yet to hear someone do a very good job yeah. of quantifying that. There's a lot of proof points where people have made mistakes not understanding implementing some of these solutions or services. Take an example out of my past, you know, implementing a, a base building network. It's, it's, it's an enabler, it's infrastructure. It doesn't actually make you any money or save you any money unless you use it for other systems or services. We, I have one, um, you know, a, a colleague that um, they saw the license costs on, on kind of the maintenance of some of the gear they bought. And they were like, this, I literally am saving nothing now because they didn't think through those typical IT you know, type service cycles and wait a minute, I'm supposed to replace these at the end of five years. I was expecting this gear to last me 20, you know, like my building automation system. So there's, there's a learning curve to some of this. And the good news is a lot of people have made these stumbles before and you can learn from them through conferences, through good case studies, through networking. Um, yeah. You just got to wade through the buzzwords, right? Yeah. Um, well, and uh, another thing, too is is also looking at not just is there an ROI but what is the payback period on that because depending upon the the strategy of the asset owner right if they're a turn and burn or if they're a long term hold that's a totally different conversation on what their threshold and what their uh, patience level is on time to return um, on those solutions um, and it's another one too if there's a solution that can also help generate a revenue model and create new revenue streams for the asset that's a whole other thing to be considerate of. So yep. um, it's a bit of a loaded question. Uh, my broad stroke uh, buzzword way to answer Danielle's this. calling us on it. ROI is one of the worst buzzwords. It is one of the worst buzzwords. You can, <laughs> you're not lying, Danielle. It is, right? yeah. unless you can prove it. Um, but to that question around, does it cost more to operate all of this technology? Um, the, the broad stroke of that is it depends. Yeah. And not all technology is meant for all buildings, right? You're not going to throw a bunch of tech into a, you know, 1960s class C building um, that's in suburbia. And you're, you're just, you're never going to get the ROI on that. I want to jump in here because Danielle just made a point that's near and dear to my heart. If, if we're saying that the old school way of buying a box of donuts and sitting down with, you know, an owner to talk about projects or doing it at a network event or at a conference, that that's the best way to go. What's the point of all this marketing, the digital marketing, the email, the what we're doing right now? 
Uh, like what, what the heck is the point? It's almost like you, you have to have that integrated marketing because there's an expectation you do it. But if you're expecting to sell something tomorrow based on it, if you're a you know product supplier, or if you're an owner trying to look for solutions this way, good luck wading through it all. Right. I mean, that, that that's really the, 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 the thousand ten thousand dollar question here. Right. Uh, and Danielle, there's, you know, when you look at outbound marketing and, and sales efforts, right, there's, there's science and then there's luck. Right. And then there's, you know, the magic touch that some individuals have. Um, I would say that the majority of salespeople, it's right time, right place, right person. Mm -hmm. And if you have to hit all three of those things, whether it's through marketing or through its, you know, direct outbound from a sales professional, right. If you're not checking all three of those, then there, there's no new opportunity. Right. Yeah, and if you're not doing it, you can miss some real, you can miss getting lucky. I'll say, um, we, we have a client that we're now five years into working for, and it all started from a cold phone call. And I, I would have told you that was a complete waste of time before that phone call. Yeah. So yeah. So almost, here's a good almost question. A requirement. Um, I'm an asset manager in my building decreased dramatically in value impacting my operating budget. I need to connect my building to do all of this stuff. I don't know what stuff is, but I, I guess yeah. just general. Technology. Every buzzword we just said today. Yeah. So how do I afford it specifically around ESG? Well, on the ESG thing, like if you're trying to do decarbonization efforts in your building, one, there's a lot of financial vehicles to help fund the CapEx side of that. There's state um, programs. There's other programs out there that uh, can help you, on the, you know, virtually completely fund the uh, the CapEx side of, of decarbonization efforts. Uh, if that's a conversation that you're interested in, you can reach out to me afterwards. I can talk to you about some of those different options. Uh, and it's actually a good segue for us for, for the next, next session too, yes. because I would, I would encourage whoever asked that question yeah. to just as an honest attorney, uh, you need to log into our next episode of I'd be thinking about. So I'm going to go ahead and transition to that. We're at time. Uh, but our, our next episode of I'd be thinking about, let me share our little splash page here. I swear we didn't plant that in the Q and A. Yeah, that, that was actually... not, definitely not. Uh, Andy, are you seeing that? Is that yep, showing? You? you got oh, it. Up. Good. All right. So everyone, next episode is going to be July twentieth, two p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be joined by Jason Rosamond, who uh, is the founder of Future Earth. Uh, we're going to be talking about myth busting carbon offsets in uh, for commercial real estate. Um, it's going to be a great topic. I virtually guarantee you the funding mechanism on decarbonization efforts, which can also tether into other things like fault detection, diagnostic and analytics and all the other tech that you want to throw into these buildings. Um, they all kind of run in tandem with each other. So it's going to be a great conversation. We're going to be touching on a lot of those points, funding for a lot of that. I almost guarantee you will be covered on the on that conversation. So it was a great Jason, question. Yeah. Jason's a wealth of knowledge on this. And I think one of the best parts of his background and what they're working on is that it's not just the E in ESG. It's actually does have, you know, social justice, environmental justice, and governance built in and and the pure financial side of carbon markets to say nothing of, you know, anything just green, you know, green that you might call greenwashing. So that's a really good session. We actually had Jason in the boot camp at, at Realcom for for a session. Um, so excited to 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 go into that in uh, the next time you thinking about. Yeah. Um, outside of that, everyone, we really appreciate you tuning in today. Uh, if you're not following us on LinkedIn, um, you've got all the information on this splash page to follow us. We got a new website that we're excited about. Check out the new website, intelligentbuildings.com. Um, and if any of you are going down a smart building journey and you need some help, hey, give us a call. We'd love to help you. So thank you, everyone, for, the, uh, for joining us today. Tune in next month, July 20th, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Take care. Thanks, everyone.